Good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to see you. Uh, I'm David Carroll from the Department of English, and uh, Shakespeare is my bread and butter. I'm, uh, I'm a Shakespeare scholar who teaches uh, a course, English 212 uh, Shakespeare, uh, in the department uh, every semester, uh, except next semester. Um, so, so if you like what you see today, I'm sorry, there's no opportunity to get any more of it uh, next fall. Uh, you'll just have to, have to cope with the disappointment. Uh, I'm going to speak today um, about Shakespeare and his reception. This is the sort of key word I'm going to, to use, um, which has a sort of fundamental etymological sense of taking something up again. So the ways in which Shakespeare has been taken up again after his own lifetime, after the, the moment of his creation of individual um, plays like Hamlet, how have later periods uh, thought through uh, this text? Um, when you stick words like Hamlet, Shakespeare, reception up on a slide and say, I'm going to cover these in 50 minutes, uh, you're sort of setting yourself up for, uh, for personal disappointment. I mean, how can we cover uh, the, these materials? I want this lecture to be as kind of useful to you as possible. Hopefully, just by rambling on in my usual way, I'll be planting some seeds that you can pick up in your discussion sections. You will be able to make fertile connections between some of the things I mentioned about early modern England and drama and the other texts that you've been reading in this very wide-ranging survey. Um, but I invite you to interrupt me with questions uh, at, any, at any time or to follow up afterwards if, uh, if a question sort of um, uh, digests or decocts in your, uh, in your mind. Here's a rough outline of some of the things I would like to spend at least some uh, time addressing and they've sort of organized the, the slides that I've presented. The first topic is theater. What happens on a stage? Since this is, I mean, I guess this is an arguable statement, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a credible claim to say that the stage is the origin of Shakespeare. That's, that's his medium. And that is uh, the, the prior area in which um, Hamlet has its being. Um, and so since you have encountered Hamlet as a written text in your uh, enormous uh, reader for uh, CVSP 203, and as a cinematic text, you've seen uh, uh, Mel Gibson's uh, 1990 version um, uh, on film, uh, I thought, you know, let, let's try and uh, think a little bit about theatre and what makes theatre different and specific uh, in, this, in this period. Um, what, is, what is the key thing that differentiates theatre from reading a text or seeing a film? Motion? Emotion. Ah, this is, this is, you're, you're feeling it now? You're, you're feeling passion and... I, I, sorry, I uh, shouldn't, um, shouldn't take... That's a, yes, so emotion is something that the actors will try to express but also communicate or excite in an audience. So there are, there are two sets of human beings who are participating in this exchange of emotions. There's the people that are the actors and there's the people who are the audience. Two sets of human beings communicating through words, through gesture, this is, this is why I was thinking uh, you might have said motion. And that experience is collaborative. So unlike watching Mel Gibson, who can't see you and doesn't really care whether you've pressed play or pressed, pressed pause, um, an actor who is in front of you can see what's going on, can stand in the wrong place on the stage and be blinded by the, by the projector, uh, can see Who's, who's looking at their cell phone and needs to be reported to the director of uh, CVSP uh, 203 for detrimental behavior. Um, in turn, you will be seeing something new every time. You pick up your copy of uh, Hamlet 
in, uh, I think the, the Folger series is the one you have. This is uh, my prop today is the Penguin that I uh, use in English uh, 212. It's the same text every time. I turn to page 74 and page 74 starts with the same word. I might read it differently because I'm coming from a different set of readings that I've done, because I'm in a different mood, but it's the same text on the page. Likewise, you stick Mel Gibson's DVD into your DVD drive, you press play, it's the same sequence of uh, cinematic images that have been recorded, framed, fixed, and are provided back to you. But theatre is live. Even when working from a set script, like an edited text of Hamlet, the way that the actors are going to interact emotionally and, and physically is going to create a, a new and different experience each time. Um, I mean, this is, this is most easy to see when things go wrong. So uh, I went many times in December, uh, three times in total, like, to the AUB production of King Lear uh, in Arabic. Perhaps some of you were at least aware that that was taking place or attended a performance yourself. One night, one of the actors forgot their line. So everything comes to a, comes to a halt. There's a moment of sort of uh, embarrassment and nervousness. That emotion is communicated to the audience who also feel a little bit of sympathetic embarrassment and, uh, and start to laugh. But then one actor does something, is able to improvise, even if it's just like moving on past that momentary interruption and providing the next line so that the play goes on. And that's something, that's something unique. It's recreated every time. So the reception of uh, a dramatic text is a very active and dynamic reception. The very, the very end of this slideshow actually includes uh, still images. So, you know, I'm not going to be able to reproduce for you how, how could I accept through uh, recorded photographs or films the actual theatrical experience of different productions of Hamlet that have been staged worldwide. Um, but at least it will give an indication of both the geographical range in which Shakespeare continues to have uh, a reception, um, also different styles of uh, production, because theatre is different in, in different places. Um, in a straightforward visual way, because the uh, habits or conventions of actually motion, of bodily posture, of uh, the rhetorical way in which lines are delivered will differ from place to place and tradition to tradition. Um, costumes will be different, sets will be, will be different. Um, so, um, with a bit of luck, if I keep uh, enough of an eye on my watch, we'll be able to see some of those and, uh, and discuss what features uh, are present there. But the first stage that I want to begin with is the early modern stage in Elizabethan London, the stage that Shakespeare wrote for. This is a bad sketch, badly reproduced. I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. The, the good thing about having such a low quality uh, image is that you can't really read these distracting Latin titles. And I don't, I don't really want you to pay any attention to those anyway. Just sort of take in the basic structure of this theater. This is a sketch made in 1596. Hamlet, Hamlet dates from around 1600. So this is very contemporary with the, with the play that you're reading. And this is one of the public theatres in London, of which there were about, about half a dozen at any time during this period at the end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century. This was a major form of entertainment. Uh, you could think of this as the equivalent of uh, a large cinema multiplex uh, in, uh, in contemporary culture. It would seat or hold about uh, a thousand people, maybe quite a few more than a thousand in the very largest examples, like the Globe Theatre, uh, for which uh, Shakespeare wrote and was the sort of repertory uh, dramatist. 
Uh, this is another theatre in a different part of London uh, called The Swan. And it's a little bit smaller, but I think you still see the um, pretty extensive scale uh, where you have uh, three sets of uh, galleries with seating for spectators here that um, enclose the stage going around. So this is like a cross section. You should imagine the continuation of all of these circles to provide gallery seating all around the space. There is a second area in which spectators could watch the play uh, on stage, and that is the standing room here around the stage itself, which is thrust out into the body of the theatre. Uh, it's also uh, elevated about, uh, about five feet, about chest high for me, um, above uh, ground level. Um, a, an architectural fact of which uh, Shakespeare takes advantage, even in the play Hamlet. Uh, you remember when uh, he and uh, Horatio hear the ghost's voice from below the earth? So the actor playing old Hamlet, the ghost, could be underneath a trap door down here saying, swear, and Hamlet can react with glee and the others with terror when they hear this, uh, this, ghost's, um, this ghost's voice. Standing room was the cheapest area of the theatre. You could be admitted uh, for a single penny, um, twice as much for a bad seat with a bad view, six times as much for a good seat with a good view overlooking the stage. Um, and I'll point, I'll point out just a, an, another couple of, uh, of things. First thing to point out is that there is a roof only over this um, building-like structure that provides a backdrop for the actors and also a covered space where the highest paying spectators or musicians or the actor playing Juliet on her balcony uh, could be uh, situated. There's also roofing above the, uh, the highest level of the galleries. Now, if you've ever spent any time in London, England, you'll know that roofing is kind of important to protect you from the terrible weather. So, um, this sort of open air theatre uh, could only really be profitably operated during the comparatively, uh, the months of comparatively good weather in summer. So the season was about, was about five or six months uh, long. Uh, and if uh, a rain shower came through and you'd only paid a penny, uh, bad luck. You, uh, you got a soaking and uh, you went home with a cold. The second thing to point out um, has slipped my mind. Here's a guy with a trumpet. <laughs> And there's a flag showing that there's a play that's going to be uh, going to be on that afternoon. But uh, anyway, there, there's an introduction to the um, the space itself. A mass audience able to access this form of entertainment at comparatively affordable prices, but at the same time with a differential pricing structure, so that you know the better sort of people could buy the better sort of seat and um, a, an arrangement of the playing space that allowed uh, verticality to be a factor in performance. You could have actors overlooking the castle wall or coming up from the basement, and a thrust stage so that unlike the rather uh, separated physical relationship that I have on this sort of uh, modern uh, proscenium stage, with you, the audience. There, there could be a lot more opportunities for direct in interaction, perhaps, perhaps better for the exchange of, uh, of emotional affect uh, in that context. Let's talk a little bit about Hamlet in particular. Um, it, would, it would take me all of the time that we have to uh, give even an adequate summary of the action of the play. So uh, I'm afraid in this lecture I'm going to sort of rely on your exposure to the movie version and, uh, and hopefully the reading that, that, that you have done and sort of leave most of the plot alone. Um, one structural observation that I will begin with is that as a plotted narrative as a story, 
Hamlet is really hard to get your head around uh, if you read through it. I remember struggling with just trying to understand what was going on and why when I first read it as a 17-year-old. And I think there's a particular, uh, there's a particular part of it, uh, I'm going to use the technical word, the middle, which is hard to assimilate in the way that we process uh, narrative fiction uh, in most of the uh, films and novels, let's say, to use dominant genres that, uh, that we tend to read today. From about the moment after Hamlet says, you know, his famous, his famous lines, uh, you know, the time is out of joint, oh cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right, after he's had that stressful encounter with the ghost. Up to when he gets banished to England, so Cla Claudius sort of realises he's some sort of vague threat and says, I'm going to send him off with uh, secret orders that he should be executed when he arrives in, in England. Between those two points, where the revenge plot that is obsessing the protagonist um, uh, gets started and gets resolved, we're just in this very wild space where Hamlet turns into some sort of uh, mischievous agent of chaos around uh, the castle at, uh, at Elsinore. Um, and one suggestion I'm going to throw out to you is that playing itself, acting, uh, the activity of adopting a role and performing it is uh, the key concept that gives some sort of semblance of structure to this uh, extremely uh, avant-garde and wild uh, couple of acts between uh, Act 2, Scene 2 and about Act 3, Scene 2. One of the reasons that uh, this is a you know, plausible thesis is that a company of actors arrive at Elsinore. Even those that you were wont to take delight in, say Rosencrantz and Guildenstern trying to cheer up Hamlet, the tragedians of the city. So the professional troupe whose space of business looks like this in Elizabethan England arrive at Elsinore and Polonius gives this uh, uh, classically long-winded summary of all of the types of plays that uh, can be expected from this, uh, from this playing group, um, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical, historical pastoral, scene individual, scene individable rather, or poem unlimited. I like this phrase, poem unlimited. A text like Hamlet, which seems to have no boundaries about uh, how much fascination it can create, um, I, I, I feel like poem unlimited is a nice little uh, uh, label uh, under which to, to think it. I'm going to argue that the most serious thing that Hamlet says during this uh, almost incoherent middle phase of the play Hamlet is this speech. It's the speech that he speaks to the head of the playing company who have come to visit. And written by William Shakespeare for a character in a theatrical play, it has a special sort of, or potentially has a special sort of significance to our interpretation, not just of this text, but of the art form as a whole. Because Hamlet gives a theory of acting. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly, on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and as, as I may say, the whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings 
who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod, I pray you avoid it. And uh, for the first player who's sort of been waiting for this to come to a stop, sort of realizes there's a moment of silence. I warrant your honor. Hamlet makes many dense points here. You can unpack this speech and pick up, let's say, uh, an available point of view on playing in Shakespeare's time. I do want to be a little bit sophisticated here and say this is not necessarily Shakespeare's theory of playing. He has created a fictional character, placed that character within the drama. That character's circumstances are so eccentric and extreme that I think everything that he says we should uh, keep under you know, uh, permanent critical inspection. But as I say, there's a certain note of sincerity that, uh, that comes through here. What's he saying? He's saying, don't speak unnaturally, but look for a kind of smoothness. Don't use exaggerated gestures, you know, soaring your hands and, uh, you know, looking like some sort of marionette. He is interested in this idea of passion. Emotion was absolutely the right sort of key word to bear in mind when you come to this. He uses passion twice. It's something that the actor is experiencing. So the actor uh, should be communicating through body and, and words some sort of emotion. But a passion is also something that is fixed in the script. So to tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to, to destroy the aesthetic creation of passion through words that is generated by the act of writing. Um, there's a couple of references at, at, at the end. You know, you can uh, you can chase up footnotes and find out who uh, Termagant and, and Herod were, um, or you can listen to me for the next two seconds. These were um, uh, particularly over the top, rhetorically excessive figures, stock figures, so characters who were repeated time and again in medieval drama, in the drama before the period of the public theatres for which Shakespeare wrote. So these are now out of fashion. Don't do it in that old, crude, unsophisticated medieval way, but bring a different sort of naturalistic criteria to your style of performance. He goes on. Be not too tame, neither but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve, the censure of which must, in your allowance, or way a whole theatre of others. So the last gesture that Hamlet makes in this phase of the speech is to divide the audience and to say here, you know, who cares if the groundlings are entertained by easy humour? What I care about is the judgment of the judicial. So Hamlet is pitching his aesthetic theory at an elite audience. This is, this is one point on which we might say we definitely do want to differentiate Hamlet's theory from Shakespeare's actual practice because the groundlings were the majority of Shakespeare's audience. Obviously, he's writing for a mixed audience that must stay mixed in order for him to be able to remain a profitable and successful writer. But this idea that an audience can be seen as a spectrum and different sorts of language, different sorts of effects can be pitched to different parts of that audience is, is also, I think, part of the, the variety uh, 
which is fun, seems to be fundamental to um, Elizabethan art and, and to Shakespearean playwriting in, in particular. Now, there are a lot of famous phrases in the first part of this section of the speech. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. You know, this is a nice, a nice chiasmus. It's easy to think of this as a sort of uh, uh, motto for naturalistic playwriting. Um, it does draw attention to the fact that there should be some sort of uh, cooperation or continuous interrelationship between movement and speech uh, in theatre. Um, the, the intriguing part is Hamlet's definition of the purpose of playing. So here's a big philosophical generalization that he makes. And he says the purpose of playing, as it has ever been, you know, he, he gets a little bit sort of pompous at this point, is to hold, as it were, so he's introducing a metaphor, the mirror up to nature. A first thought you might sort of have in reaction to the phrase, hold the mirror up to nature, is simply reflect appearance as it is. Ac accurately render back a reflection like a, like a mirror does. Um, but he expands a little bit here. Holding a mirror up to nature is going to involve these activities, to show virtue her own image, sorry, virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. So uh, virtue and scorn, here probably the word means not so much uh, a posture of scorn as something which deserves to be scorned. It's creating a pairing with, with virtue. So uh, something good to be admired, something vicious to be uh, uh, condemned or avoided. That suggests that theatre has some sort of moral purpose. That the purpose of accurate representation of things through technologies of fiction in the architecture of, of a theatre is to provide exemplar illustrations of virtue and vice with the implicit idea that people will be attracted to the former and uh, repelled from the latter. This is a vibrant part of discourse around theatre, I was going to say, in, in Shakespeare's day. Certainly that, that's true, although this, this argument about the, um, the moral purpose or arguments against the moral danger of fictional representation, whether in, in plays or in the visual arts or, or, or elsewhere, um, that's, that's a big part of discourse in Elizabethan culture because plays were controversial. Uh, there was a, a very serious and somewhat politically powerful anti-theatrical movement saying that this is, it's terrible for your morals to go to um, uh, the theatre and see um, uh, all, you know, all sorts of damaging things. Men dressed in women's clothing and uh, pretending to be women. This is, this is terrible for you. Uh, you know, uh, people murdering one another. Uh, and when you think about Hamlet, certainly the latter mo moral problem is right at the centre of the representation. It's a play about whether and how to kill in the absence of any judicial system. Um, so having theatrical discourse so self-consciously present at the centre of the play would, I think, trigger for an original audience um, this question of the moral purpose of these representations, the purpose of playing. Here's a sort of transition uh, into this question of to kill or not to kill that is at the center of the plot of Hamlet. This is, um, this is Horatio, Hamlet's sort of, um, a uh, steady friend who's there to, to be a sort of um, uh, 
control human being against his extremity, perhaps. Um, this is almost the last speech of the play. Things are just getting resolved. The, the Norwegian king Fortinbras has come. Uh, he uh, sees this scene of slaughter where basically every member of the Danish court is, uh, is dead, either from poison or, uh, or uh, sword wounds. Uh, and he says to Horatio, what's happened? Horatio, uh, cool, calm, and dour at all times, says, give order that these bodies high on a stage be placed to the view, and let me speak to the yet unknowing world how these things came about. So shall you hear, and this is the point at which Horatio becomes the first author of a Sparknotes edition of, of Hamlet. He, he gives a quick summary of what's in, in this play. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, and in this upshot, purposes mistook fallen on the inventor's heads. All this can I truly deliver. You're going to hear about carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, people making mistakes and dying for it, casual slaughter, accidental judgments, people not using their, their minds and, uh, um, properly and there being these terrible fatal consequences. Does that strike you as starting but serious students of this play as a good summary? Yeah. Kind of. Would you want to supplement it? What would you want to add? If you think about like, what, what was it like to read Hamlet? Was it like watching an episode of Game of Thrones, which seems to be sort of like what's, what's being summarized here? What do you think? What's the difference? I'll get your comment on the way. It's tragic. Thank you very much. I think it's more clever and out there than that. More clever and out there. Can you expand? It's not just about bloodshed and unnatural acts and all that. They all got to that point because of several incidents, several uh, encounters, uh, conversations, judgments that were going on that led to the end. It wasn't just about like car um, bloodshed, unnatural acts, accidental judgments. There was something that happened and uh, conversations that took place that led to that. Conversation, judgment was another word that you used. Acts of thinking, yes. Since I'm down here, would you like to add, add anything to that? Does it say okay? <laughs> I agree. And I've even sort of put my cards on the table. I see yeah, I'm going to have to change this slide next time so as not to spill the beans. Interiority. What Horatio is describing is the visible effects of this series of incidents that have uh, occurred uh, in, in, in Denmark. So what's happened is a whole lot of corpses have been generated. But what we have been privy to as readers of the play or spectators are characters showing their thought processes. Hamlet never stops thinking and he loves telling you what he's thinking about and how intensely he's thinking about it. And this element of interiority, I think if you want to depict sort of one skeleton key to the fact that this play has had such a robust reception and a reception that you can connect to some of the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment texts that you're reading in CVSP 203, it's because Hamlet as a possible representation of thinking, particularly thinking in, in a humanist mode and in philosophical categories that sort of become um, important to intellectual history, like metaphysics, like ethics, um, that is placed inside a form, revenge tragedy, that had hitherto been seen as rather inert 
with respect to thinking. So yes, carnal, bloody and unnatural acts, plus thinking, plus conversation. Uh, absolutely. Thank you very much for your contributions. It's also tragic. Yeah. Here are some uh, key uh, quotes that I'll just sort of quickly uh, pass through that uh, signal interiority as a theme. And it's a theme particularly associated with the protagonist. Hamlet, this is after, um, uh, this is early in the play, after his mother Gertrude has uh, challenged him to uh, smile a bit more around the court. Um, uh, and, he, and he says, "'Tis not my inky cloak alone, dear madam, nor customary suits of solemn black. You know, don't, don't criticize my excellent uh, hipster fashion. I have that within which passes show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. There's something inside me that you can't have access to just by looking. He says later when he's being a little bit more, um, a little bit more expressive, letting himself go a little bit more in conversation with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I had bad dreams. Some, to him, very deep and profound mental space is a source of infinite discomfort. You know, if he wasn't somebody who could be racked by troubling thoughts, then he would need nothing else. He could be confined within the space of a nutshell, imprisoned and immobile, and feel um, as if he had perfect freedom. But what he calls his conscience uh, troubles him. Here's a moment where he's a little bit more expansive and gives a sort of model or metaphor for his own relationship to his mind. This is right after the ghost leaves him at the end of Act One, saying, remember me. Remember thee? Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain. So he uses a, a textual metaphor, as if his brain were a notebook. And he says, I'm going to erase everything. <laughs> And he seems to be speaking in a tone of relief here. All of that stuff that I used to study, all of those intellectual ideas, moral precepts, rhetorical figures that I spent all of my school days and my university days at Wittenberg thinking about and worrying my conscience over, at last I can just get rid of them. You know, select all, delete. All I'm going to remember is thy, thy commandment, which is revenge. Revenge my foul and most unnatural murder. I'll just kill my stepdad. That's all I have to worry about. This posture lasts for about 10 seconds. There's a very nice way in which Shakespeare's writing shows how futile this attempt to commit to monomania is going to be in the case of Hamlet, because he follows up from this by thinking of the paradox that someone can smile and smile and be a villain. And he says to himself, meet it is I set it down. And he pulls out his notebook and he writes down, one can smile and smile and be a villain. He immediately undoes the metaphor that he's just used to try and show his commitment to throwing aside his conscience and just doing an act. He's straight back into the world of textuality and thinking. Here's another moment. Um, I just glanced at my watch, so I realize I can't do the same sort of close reading of this moment. But I wonder if, I wonder if anyone recognizes it. Where's this moment where Hamlet says, I could do it. I could do this act 
that I tried to commit to in the immediate aftermath of conversation with the ghost. Nada again? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Now he is a praying. Claudius is praying. This is right after the play within the play has taken, part, taken place. Hamlet sees him praying. He says, he's absolutely vulnerable to me. It's the perfect moment. And now I'll do it, he even says. But then the thinking machine takes over. And he argues himself out of it. This little phrase, that would be scanned. So the idea that he has just articulated would be, should be, invites being scanned, analysed, uh, teased out. And when he starts that analysis, all motive to action is completely dissipated. As I say, no time to sort of tease that out in detail. Um, here's, a, here's a quote that, if I did have a fly sheet, would be prominently on that fly sheet. This is um, from an essay called Of Revenge by, uh, by Francis Bacon, a, a name that has probably been uttered from this stage already uh, during CBSP 203. Are there even readings uh, by, by Bacon? Good, good to hear. Revenge is a kind of wild justice which the more man's nature runs to, the more ought law to weed it out. This is a nice little statement of the moral problem of revenge, but also the social or the political problem of revenge. Revenge becomes an issue, like it does in Hamlet, when uh, law, through... Uh, through dysfunction, through absence, through some interruption to uh, human institutions of justice is not available to provide it. And so you get revenge as a kind of substitute, a wild justice, the justice that belongs to the wilderness outside of civility. Um, Hamlet, of course, is... Uh, completely on the side of institutional and social systems. So for, for him, for his mentality, for his training, for his worldview to be placed under an absolute imperative from his father to engage in this kind of wild justice, this seems to be impossible for him. And this provokes all of the thought and all of the, all of the emotion of interior troubling and tension and pain that occupies the play and for which this uh, often disorienting substitute motion and substitute discourse comes to stand. So uh, there's a theme that perhaps you'll uh, open up in, um, uh, in class discussions. I really will rush to the end so that I can show you some of the uh, excellent images from international productions of Hamlet that I've, that I've gathered. Um, but I want to do one exercise with one of Hamlet's most famous, surely, surely Hamlet's absolutely most famous example of articulated thought. The soliloquy, so the, the speech that he speaks alone on stage, that begins to be or not to be. Now, this, this speech is famous enough that you've probably heard it, even if you'd never read the play before. Uh, so everybody in the room, more or less, would be able to finish this line, I'm sure. To be or not to be? That is the question. Good, excellent. And look, I just uh, thought I'd go back to the, um, uh, the earliest printed texts from the Elizabethan period and, uh, and show you what it looks like in print. To be or not to be. I, there's the point. Hang on a second. No, it's all right, it's all right. This is, yes, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arm against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. What I have here are the two earliest editions of Hamlet. 
in book history, they're called quartos. That's the name of the format of the book. It means it's like uh, about the size of an A4 sheet of paper folded in half. And this was the format in which uh, all of Shakespeare's plays that were published during his own lifetime appeared. In some cases, like in the case of Hamlet, multiple versions of uh, these early format plays were printed sometimes by different printers, sometimes the same printer. The earliest text, and therefore perhaps the most authoritative text of the play Hamlet, says, to be or not to be, I, there's the point. Only in the second quarto, which is advertised on its title page as newly expanded and corrected according to the true original copy. And so editors, you know, uh, uh, in the modern day, sort of breathe a big sigh of relief. Oh, this is the correct one. Look, it says so on the on the cover. Um, so we can print to be or not to be. That is the question. Great. We don't have to uh, disturb anyone's um, uh, book of quotations. Um, I did want to show you this, though, because there's a way in which this textual instability of Hamlet of this sort of most famous canonical text of uh, early modern English literature is requires you know thorough critical engagement just to get to the text that we call Hamlet and this fact was well known to intellectuals within early modern culture the fact that there were multiple competing textual witnesses for the classical texts, which were becoming the foundation for uh, contemporary thought and education, the fact that there were multiple texts and traditions of the Bible, of scripture. This is one of those uh, big disturbances in intellectual culture that you could match up with uh, the new science, uh, with the Reformation, the other big ideas that you've been uh, talking about uh, in, in this class. Even, even Hamlet is, is directly implicated. Um, after Shakespeare died, the leaders of his playing company assembled a sort of collected works which provides a, a different and new textual tradition. This is called the First Folio. And in a future version of this uh, lecture where I uh, uh, get to this slide earlier, I will talk about it. Let me just very, very quickly, okay, there it goes. Let's get to the nice pictures at the end. Just to show you a range of modern productions of Hamlet. This is in fact um, not a version of uh, the Shakespearean text of Hamlet, but um, a, a play based on Hamlet uh, by the uh, Kuwaiti uh, author Suleiman al uh, the Al Hamlet Summit, which uh, premiered at uh, the Tokyo International Theatre Festival in, uh, in uh, 2004. Um, here's also from Tokyo, a Japanese version of uh, Shakespeare. And he, this is a nice illustration of a point I made like right at the outset, that different national traditions of theater will cause a sort of translation, not just of the text of Shakespeare, but also of the blocking, where, where the actors are positioned on, on stage, bodily gesture and posture. My guess is that this moment is uh, very early on, that this is the court scene. And, you know, mainly, maybe Hamlet is about to say his, his famous uh, cutting first line, a little, a little more than kin and less than kind. You know. English tradition. Olivier communing with Yorick's skull. Peter Hall's pr production, uh, uh, making a little bit more of the, um, uh, the antic comedy of the gravediggers. Um, who can spot this? What moment is this in Hamlet? When he storms in on his mother, excellent. So Gertrude's bedchamber. And here's an example of the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, going into a uh, educational context, um, just as just as this has been, although I suspect you are rather more sophisticated readers than, than that audience. Let me wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy talking about Hamlet uh, in your uh, discussion sections and continuing 
in reading theatrical texts when you get uh, into Goethe's Faust uh, next week and beyond. Thanks very much. <laughs>